And welcome to part three. <laughs> we're wearing the same clothes because we're filming this one right after the same other. Time, yeah. Yeah, same time, yeah. Same time, same place. Yeah. Okay, um, so now looking at uh, moving on past just the navigation and time telling to uh, an exploration of the, the universe and using scientific tools to, uh, to study astronomy. How do we know what's out there? Uh, and how do we study it? Okay, so models of the universe. You know what? I'm going to shrink us down. Bye. <laughs> But we're still here. <laughs> we're still here. Okay. Uh, so once upon a time, uh, it was thought that the Earth was the, the center of the universe and everything kind of rotated around us. So all the things in the sky were just kind yeah. of big big wheels, big, yeah. big spheres uh, rotating around. Then along comes this dude named Galileo. Yeah. And uh, in 1609, yeah. he, uh, he proves that. Yeah. Wrong. And the funny thing is, is that if you went back to ancient Greece, the ancient Greeks could prove to you that the Earth was the center of the universe because they say, we're standing on the Earth, and if you look up at the sky, you actually see it move. And so they said, well, we're not moving, but that's because they're actually on Earth. They don't realize they're moving. Yeah, so you don't, you don't really feel it, right? Because even though near the equator, we're actually rotating at about a, well, 1,000 miles an hour, really. Something like that, yeah. Um, but it's a, it's a large distance. You don't really you you don't don't, notice you it. Don't feel it. Um, so that, that was the, the geocentric, geo meaning earth and centric meaning center, obviously. So the other model is the heliocentric or sun-centered model, uh, which, speaking of the Greeks, this yes. was actually proposed by Aristarchus 300 years BC, right. um, and people went, you crazy. Yeah, uh, we saw that before in the atom. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Can you imagine how far we would be if like people believe people, people two thousand years in ago? Aristarchus and and the Adam, like, no. oh, anyway. we have like you know warp drive by now. Okay, uh, so then there's this guy named Nic uh, Nicholas Copernicus, uh, who was actually a, a, a priest and a math as well as a mathematician, and uh, because what he was studying kind of went against the, the teachings church. of the Catholic Church, he actually didn't publish any of his work until after he died. Yeah. Uh, the church was very anti against this sort of thing, mainly because they felt that if somebody says that we're wrong, then people might start to believe we're wrong about God and all of our power disappears and things yeah, go crazy. Yeah, and that would, be, that would be kind of... Anyway, uh, so then in 1609, Galileo um, looked at Jupiter with his telescope and he yes. noticed that Jupiter had little moons. Yeah, he saw three, were I believe. Four, four. Four, which are still known as the Galilean moons. Oh, right. Yeah. And he saw that they were actually orbiting around Jupiter. Mm -hmm. And so suddenly he had proof that something was orbiting around something other than Earth. Right. Uh, which kind of blew out the whole Earth as the center of everything. Yeah. And Galileo's telescope, I think they said, was about, what, six feet or something like this? Six or eight feet long? It's about, uh, it's about five feet long. Okay. Um, the objective is only about uh, an inch in diameter. Mm -hmm. And I think he actually stopped it down, so it was only about... Maybe half an inch or three quarters of an inch. It's pretty tiny. It'd be like looking through a drinking straw. Yeah, I know he that he ground his own lenses. Oh yeah, well they they all yeah. did. They all did. Yeah. Okay, so the modern model. Um, there's lots of planets in our solar system. Right. Uh, the sun is the center of the solar system. Mm -hmm. There's gazillions of asteroids and yeah. Kuiper belt objects and comets and all that kind of stuff. Uh, and then our sun is just What's a that? star. Mm -hmm. And it's not even a particularly spectacular one at that. Thank no, goodness, because we'd be fried. <laughs> and there's a, so there's a hundred billion or so stars in our galaxy, and there's hundreds of billions of galaxies. So it's a, the universe is a much, much bigger place than oh, yeah. the ancient people um, right. knew about. Uh, okay, so before telescopes were really widely used to study the universe, um, people used mechanical devices. Um, to, uh, to try to, to get an idea of to get yeah, yeah. To, yeah to figure out what was where and to to map the the stars and 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 the motions of the planets and the sun and the moon mm -hmm. and everything, and so that one of the things they've used is this thing called an armillary sphere and there's a there's a picture of a beautiful one uh, yeah. here which is uh, stands about nine feet tall it's right. it's enormous like it's standing on the floor and it goes right up and to it the circles seat. inside of circles inside of and they all circles. move yeah they all move so that they, they all, and so these things were used to to map and plot positions of things and do calculations of mm -hmm. where planets would be on certain times and right. where the sun would be and when the next eclipse would be and all that kind of stuff they weren't perfect but they were pretty good for the time yeah that's a, that's a geocentric uh, mechanical model so mm -hmm. those really would have been popular prior to the discovery of the helicentric yes. model, but it yeah. can still be used 
to figure out where things are in the oh, sky. Yeah. Um, it's just not sort of technically correct. Yeah, well, but it still looks right from, yeah. from the Earth. But for the technology of its time, it was great and pretty. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, the other thing is, is an orrery, um, which is hard to say, orrery, orrery. Uh, and it's basically a clockwork solar system. So yeah. this is a, 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 geo, or a, a heliocentric, sorry, I mm had -hmm. heliocentric model. So there's the sun in the middle and the planets. And this right. one actually has a little moon, ring this little yeah. uh, moon ring. Um, and uh, so this one's like a beautifully carved one from 18th century Florence. But we have one from our yeah, classroom. Yeah, in fact, this one right here that you see is actually a little wind-up toy, but this one is uh, ours. This is electric. I'm going to move it right out of the way of the sun here. And what we have, you can kind of see there's a couple of planets off to the side here. I'm going to swing it all the way over. There we go. And what we have is we have the sun in the middle, and then we have little planets. You can tell Saturn because they've nicely put the rings there. And if you know the order of the planets, you know which one's which. And when we turn this thing on, each of these guys rotates at a different speed around the sun relative to their orbit around the actual sun. Right. So it's the, the, the relative motion of these is the same as the relative motion of the actual planets. Yeah. So you'll see some guys going really fast and others moving really, really slowly. And you'll actually notice there's, there's one prong, this one right here, it doesn't actually have a planet on it. That's where Pluto would be. It was Pluto. It was Pluto. It went missing before Pluto was demoted, but... Yeah, true. Yeah. Since Pluto is no longer a planet, we're okay with that. That's not a problem anymore. Um, and so because these things go, like, the closer you are to the sun, the faster you spin. And so the guys way out here take a long time. Like, Pluto goes around the sun once every almost 250 years. Yeah. But you can, you can actually do some calculations with this, right? Like, you could line up... Uh, Earth and Venus. Earth and Venus are going to be lined up on June 5th this year. Yes. And we could then start it and we could say, well, how long until Earth and Venus line up again? Line up again, yeah. And, and you, you know, because one, one rotation of the Earth is one, one year. year. Yeah. And so when they line up, and you can even tell because on, on the, you can't see it here, but I'll, I'll kind of tip it there. But um, right here on the bottom ring here, we have different uh, months. And so you can tell where it is on a particular month and that sort of idea. So not only can you say it's going to happen 25 years from now, but you say it's going to happen in November 25 years from now. That yeah. sort of idea. And just to show you that I'm still nerdy, <laughs> I have an orrery on my iPhone. <laughs> okay. Uh, let's shrink this up and move on to telescopes. Uh -huh. Expert. <laughs> dun, 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 dun. Okay, so there's a couple different types of telescope, mm -hmm. um, and we can kind of group them. Uh, the refractor telescope uses lenses. Right. And it's, it's, your, it's, your, it's your classic, you know, pirate movie, look through a telescope kind of deal. Yeah. Um, so that has a, an objective lens on the end, mm -hmm. and that uh, creates an image um, which is then viewed through uh, another an eyepiece, yeah. right? So there's two lenses. There's, yeah. a, there's an objective lens at one end and then uh, an, an eyepiece lens. Uh, and it was first used by Galileo, but the, as we mentioned before, the, the, the one that he used right. was, was kind of a sketchy design with yeah. the, looking through a drinking straw. Yeah, and his was like a fixed sort of distance. Uh, I, I don't think, think could, he could I think, adjust. It. I think he could. I think it was oh, like really? sliding tubes. Oh, like one sliding tubes, other. of course. Um, perhaps, although it was it was rolled leather. I think the tube was made of. Yeah. Yes, it was. It was. I remember because he was um, the reason he was in Italy to build this was he was trying to beat. He was trying to actually get a military contract. Yeah, because it could be used to to to, to see look for ships. ships and the and further you could look, the more advanced warning you had. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, there's a, a guy by the name of Johannes Kepler, another very famous uh, oh, astronomer, yeah. and uh, he developed a, um, a slightly different version, which was able to produce a, a wider picture, field yeah. of view. Mm -hmm. um, it was upside down, a yeah. flipped upside down, which, which wouldn't be useful for military purposes. No, no, it's a little weird if the ship is upside down. <laughs> Uh, okay, so here's a model of the refractor, basically. Um, we have uh, a long tube, we have an objective lens which focuses the light, which is then viewed uh, yeah. through, uh, through an eyepiece. Yeah, and you can see where the lines cross. This is the reason that your picture ends up upside down, is because if you look at the bottom red line, which is the light, and the it top red the, line, the top. they actually cross each other, and so that's why you have an upside down picture. Uh, so there's my refractor. Um, I know it's a red telescope on a pink <laughs> <Big> mouth, <base. laughs> but anyway, 
Uh, so that's sort of a, 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 a classic um, amateur astronomy uh, right. refractor. Right. But yours but, is computer controlled. Uh, on this mount, yes. Um, okay, uh, a reflector telescope doesn't use um, lenses, it uses mirrors. Mm -hmm. So mirrors can be used to, to focus an image as well. Um, but it still uses some kind of eyepiece to, to then yeah, see that. Yeah, you need to see it. To see that image. So there's two types, really two main types. Um, one was invented by Sir Isaac Newton, which is called the Newtonian Telescope, and one that was by, invented by a French guy named Cascarin. <laughs> Cascarin. Love that name. Um, which we sort of bastardize in English into Cascarin, yeah. or Cassegrain. Um, and so in a Newtonian reflector, and we'll, we'll show you diagrams in a second, mm -hmm. um, there's, a, there's an angled secondary which bounces the light out the side of the tube. Right, yeah, you're actually looking through the side rather than... You know. Right. And then in the cast grain, uh, it bounces the light back through a hole in the middle of the primary mirror. Yeah, it's like a ricochet kind of idea. Yeah, so the Newtonian reflector kind of does that, right? Mm -hmm. So there's the light coming through, it hits the primary mirror down at the bottom of the telescope, bounces off this diagonal uh, secondary flat mirror, and then up through the eyepiece. Now, is the image in this one upside down as well? Uh, it is, yes, because yes. it's two surfaces. Right. Right, there's, there's two mirrors, uh, and it's still, you can see the, how it's Yeah, they, they still cross, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and then a cast grain reflector, it does this, mm -hmm. right? So it's actually shooting the image back through a hole in the, in the primary mirror. Yeah, and you would think that it's funny that they're using a mirror, but the idea is that the mirror can collect a lot yeah, of light. Um, uh, the, the, the mirror, um, if you've got a giant lens, the largest refractor in the world is the, um, uh, it's a 40 inch refractor. Mm -hmm. And the, the lens on that thing, I mean, it's, yeah. well, well you it's, can over, it's over, yeah. Yeah, it's 40 inches in diameter. Yeah, it's a piece of glass and bigger than a mirror stick. Yeah. And, and it's so heavy that it, it sags under its own weight. Yeah. And that distorts the light. Yeah, because if the, if the glass actually bends because it's so heavy, then it changes, it the changes focus. your picture. Right. Whereas a mirror, it's just going th bouncing off the front surface, mm -hmm. so they can make a, a, a much more sturdy slab of glass because mm -hmm. the light doesn't have yeah, to. Yeah, and through. you can support it from underneath. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so this is a this is a cast grain. Actually, this is a, uh, uh, like a home uh, amateur astronomy telescope. So this is a, a cast grain type reflector, and there's a tiny re refra refractor. Not uh, for aiming. Sitting on top. Yeah, so actually this one has three. This one's for aiming. Mm -hmm. uh, this one's kind of for wide field um, tracking mm -hmm. and uh, sort of getting the big picture. Right. Uh, and then this one is kind That's of a... Like a, your a, zoom lens. It's, yeah, it's a, it's a high-powered thing. Um, and then I've got cameras hanging off the back of that. Mm -hmm. uh, and then this is uh, a classical cast grain. Uh, which is the largest telescope in the country. I was gonna say, yeah. Um, the David Dunlop Observatory in Richmond Hill. Mm -hmm. um, and there's actually a short video uh, after this that explains yes. the optics. Yes, uh, yeah, of, because of you're actually involved with the DDO. Yeah. And uh, yeah, so this one has a large primary mirror down here and a secondary mirror up here. And for perspective, these are people down here, just to give you a sense of how big this actually is. And cool. Okay. Um, so those are optical telescopes. We can also look at other parts of the, the electromagnetic spectrum. Right. So we use uh, radio telescopes and mm -hmm. those are, uh, they don't have to be shiny like a mirror. And, no. You know, so you can basically just have a metal dish that will yeah. reflect radio waves. Uh, and there's all kinds of stuff that we can find out about right. the sky from yeah, radio waves. And, you know, as you can see, that's obviously your classic satellite dish, as they call it. Yeah. This is the... Uh, uh, Parks uh, radio telescope that was um, featured in the movie The Dish, mm -hmm. which is uh, this is in Australia. It's a great movie if you uh, if you are looking for an astronomy yes. kind of a movie to <laughs> to watch. Uh, and this is the uh, Arecibo Arecibo radio telescope mm -hmm. in uh, Puerto Puerto Rico. Puerto Rico. Yes. Puerto Rico. Yeah. Um, and it was used, you were saying it was used in a James... It was used in a James Bond movie, Goldeneye. And in fact, that dish, I believe, is in the crater of a volcano. But that's it's inactive. Yeah, well, I would hope so. Obviously. <laughs> uh, it was also used in the movie Contact. Yes. With J Jodie Foster. Yeah. Uh, okay. Um, and sometimes we want telescopes uh, beyond the atmosphere. Because the atmosphere right. can, uh, can block... Blocks the light. 
well, it, it warps the light, but it also blocks some wavelengths of light, right? Like infrared oh, yeah. light doesn't mm -hmm. come through the Earth's atmosphere very well. And so we want to... And they don't work well with clouds. <laughs> yeah, and you know what? In space, um, you can always point it away from the sun, and you can... It's always nighttime. Right. It's always night. Yeah, exactly. So these are some uh, space telescopes. This is the, the Hubble Space Telescope, probably the most famous, famous mm -hmm. not just space telescope, but telescope. Telescope, period. Period. Yeah. Um, it's been up there 20-odd years. Yeah, it's been up there for a good long time. Yeah. Um, this is, I think this one's Kepler, mm -hmm. which is currently looking for exoplanets. Uh, this one, is that the Chandra X-ray? I think that's be? Chandra, yeah. And this little guy <laughs> is Canada's space telescope. It's called MOST, uh, and it's the size of a briefcase. Yeah, you gotta love it. It's square, it's tiny, it's Canadian. <laughs> And uh, it's, it's also referred to as the Humble Space Telescope yes. because of its size. But uh, given its size, and it was kind of piggybacked on somebody else's rocket, it's been doing uh, a tremendous job uh, for a fraction of the cost of some of these other ones. It's funny how the Canadians can do that. <laughs> okay, that's all it. All right, that's all. Any questions, please ask.